الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله يما بعد With the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala We want to come together today for some clarification With regards to some matters that have taken place In the city of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania In the last weeks and months From the affairs of crime And the affairs of criminality Bank robbery, murder, drug dealing and the likes of carrying of illegal weapons and all of these affairs that quake and shake the safety and security of our society. And there has resulted from these activities of individuals who are criminals and we testify to the fact that they are indeed criminals. That there has resulted from these activities a number of different articles and different programs and the different medias of the news that have pointed the finger at the religion of Islam and has tried to attribute these actions to the noble and lofty way of Allah, the religion of Islam. So we find it incumbent upon ourselves to make clarification with regards to what is the true stance of Al-Islam with regards to these matters that have taken place. And that can only be understood according to the text and sources of this religion, which are the holy book, the Quran, and the authentic prophetic traditions of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. And first and foremost, these actions that took place in our city from murder and armed robbery, and drug trafficking, and other than it, are all acts which are from the greatest sins in Islam, and which are totally rejected by our upright way of life. Rather, the act of carrying weapons to disturb the safety and security of society is from the most evil and heinous actions in the religion of Islam. Now, I want to start off by talking about how important safety and security is in our religion. There is more than one verse that mentions in the Quran the importance of safety and security in the earth. And there's more than one narration, prophetic tradition from our Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, that mentions the importance of tranquility in the earth and safety and security. And I want to mention a few of them with some of the explanations of the scholars of this religion so as to be an introduction and a foundation with regard to that which we are trying to discuss here today. Firstly, our Lord Allah says in the Quran, the noble Quran, Allah has promised those among you who believe and do righteous good deeds that he will certainly grant them secession in the earth as he granted it to those who came before them and that he will grant them with authority to practice their religion, and he will surely give them in exchange safety and security after their fear. So in this particular verse, we find one of the greatest benefits of this verse is that those who practice righteous deeds and noble deeds, that their reward after this will be safety and security in the earth. This shows us that safety and security is a good thing and a noble thing that is the reward of the righteous. Also, Allah says in another verse in the Quran, it is a great grace from Allah for the protection of Quraysh. We cause the caravans of the Quraysh to set forth safe in winter to the south and in the summer to the north without any fear. So let them worship Allah, the Lord of this house meaning the Kaaba in Mecca. He who has fed them against hunger and made them safe from fear. These particular verses in the Quran, firstly we want to mention, are talking about the caravans of the Quraysh. And the Quraysh are a tribe from the tribes of the Arabs, of which the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, was a member. He was from the tribe of Quraysh. And Allah is talking here about the caravans, as that many of them were merchants, and they used to take their wares about in the different cities and towns of their country in Arabia and outside of Arabia to sell these affairs amongst the people. 
And one of the things that they were reminded of was the blessing of their Lord. That their Lord made them safe from fear. That they were able to travel without anyone hijacking their caravans. Without anyone killing and murdering the people who took about their wares in the earth. That it was from a blessing that they were able to travel without, without fear of being taken by weapons and to be harmed and to be killed. And then after this, Allah says, so let them worship. Let them be truthful in their worship of the one God who has fed them against hunger because of what they have made from their sails. They're able to feed themselves and take care of themselves and has made them safe from fear. So one of the blessings that should be mentioned and counted is that one is able to walk about in his daily life or her daily life in tranquility and peace and that safety and security are from those matters of which our religion calls to and praises. Afterwards, we want to mention another verse from the holy book, the noble book, the Quran, where Allah says, and these are some of the people who say this, if we follow the guidance with you, we would be snatched away from our land. And Allah answers, he says, have we not established for them a secure sanctuary to which are brought fruits of all kinds, a provision from ourselves, but most of them do not know. So this particular verse also mentions that Allah has created for them a secure sanctuary, a place that is free from harm, a place that is free from murder, fighting and chaos and the likes of these matters, speaking specifically here about Mecca and Arabia. So here we see from these narrations that have preceded, these verses that have preceded, the great command of our Lord to establish safety and security in the earth and that it is a reward of the righteous and that it is a noble and honorable thing that all people strive for and hope for in their lives and for their children. And we want to mention an authentic prophetic tradition that was narrated from our prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, by one of his companions whose name was Ubaidullah ibn Muhsin. Ubaidullah ibn Muhsin, he was a companion of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. With the Prophet Muhammad, he said, whoever wakes safe and secure, free from fear for himself and his family, and in good health, and has enough provisions to last him for his day, it is as if the whole world has been laid at his feet. If a person wakes in safety and security, free from fear for himself and his family, and is in good health, and has enough provisions to last for a day, it is as if the whole world has been laid at his feet. So from those things that are a blessing for a man that brings them tranquility in mind, that brings them security in thought, is that they are free from fear. They don't have to concern themselves with people going about in the earth with weapons, murdering people, and robbing people. And harming people. So this affair that our Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings, has mentioned, it shows us what Islam's position is with regards to safety and security in the earth. So there should be no question whatsoever as to what is the correct Islamic position regarding safety and security in the land. It is from the greatest blessings of our Creator. If it were not for safety and security, People in society would go about in their could not go about in their daily lives, working, shopping, going to school, and taking care of every type of basic need. Without safety and security in the earth, the opposite of chaos and lawlessness would prevail, and the result would be widespread panic and fear. So it becomes incumbent upon every Muslim to supplicate to Allah for safety in the earth and to work diligently to be from those who do not cause corruption, anxiety, and fear among citizens of every town, village, city, or country. That is our command. That is our command. So after mentioning some of these affairs of the importance of safety and security in the religion of Al-Islam, I want to move on to some of the questions that have come up, most specifically regarding an article in Philadelphia Magazine, a February issue, that was titled, The Radicals Among Us. And in this particular article, the writer claims that there is a brand of Islam that calls to criminality, that calls to murder, 
and armed robbery and drug dealing and the likes of these matters. And even inside of this article, try to connect that to the methodology of the Salaf, those who say they are Salafi. And he also said the Wahhabis, the Salafi Wahhabis from Saudi Arabia, he said, were radicalizing prisoners so as to cause them to do the likes of these actions that we are seeing out here from the murder of police officers and the, the robbing of banks and the carrying of weapons and the selling of drugs and all of the likes of these matters. So we want to clarify beyond a shadow of a doubt what is the true position of the one who claims to be Salafi and what he says with regard to these matters that we have discussed and whether or not there is any connection whatsoever between those affairs and the methodology of those who say they are Salafi. First and foremost, I'll read the question. Who are the Salafis? In the media, we constantly hear the word Salafi being attributed to extremism and more recently in an article in Philadelphia magazine entitled Radicals Among Us, we see it being attributed to the radicalization of prisoners and criminals in Philadelphia and leading to some of the heinous acts that have taken place from them, the murder of police officers. So we answer this question by saying, first of all, there is a saying of old that mentions the truth is not judged by men, but rather men are to be judged by the truth. So we should not automatically attribute the actions of a group of individuals to the teachings of a way or a faith. We look first to the teachings of that way and that faith and then judge those individuals in the scales of the principles laid down in that way or that faith. That is justice and that is what is correct. So what then is the definition of a Salafi before entering into this argument? Firstly, we say to answer this question properly and to understand this term correctly, one must refer it back to the language from where it originates. For certainly it has its origins in the Arabic language and in the Islamic terminology. As for the Arabic language, then it derives from an Arabic verb, salafa, salafa, which means a thing that has preceded or passed away, or everything that has preceded a man from his ancestors and forefathers. And in the Islamic terminology, it refers specifically to the companions of the Messenger of Allah, Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and the two generations of people that followed those companions. And they are known as the Tabi'een in Arabic, the followers of the companions, and the third generation being the Atba'a Tabi'een, in Arabic of course meaning the followers of the followers of the companions. A proof of the virtue of these three generations in our religion is found in the authentic saying of our Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, the best of mankind is my generation and the generation that follows it and the generation that follows it. So there is no question whatsoever that from the reasons why we ascribe ourselves to the Salaf, the companions, that first generation, is because of their nobility and because of their honor and because of them striving to follow the pure teachings that are found in the Quran, the holy book, and the prophetic traditions of our Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. One of the scholars of Islam, known as Al-Qalshani, he wrote with regards to the meaning of Salaf, and he said, The Salaf of Salih, the pious predecessors, are the first generation of the Muslims that were firmly grounded in knowledge, the followers of the guidance of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and the preservers of his way and manner. Allah chose them to be the companions of his Prophet and selected them to establish the religion. So now we say it is far-fetched the statement of those who say that the Salafi or Salafia is a new movement which has sprung forth in recent times or some radical ideology. Rather, it is the very same methodology of the companions of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, the one who said, that indeed this ummah of mine, this nation of mine, of Muslims, is going to divide upon 73 different sects, all of them in the hellfire except one of those sects. And when the people asked the Prophet, when the companions asked the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, 
And who is that saved group, that saved sect from amongst all of those 73 sects? He said, what I am upon today and my companions. What I am upon today and my companions. So to truly judge someone in accordance to this matter, then they must be judged and whether or not they are following the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and the actions of those noble companions who are the Salaf. So one may ask, who is the one who calls himself Salafi and why? Is this attribution of, of one who follows the Salaf in the sound understanding of Islam without straying from the pure teachings and one who does not inject into the religion newly invented matters? Again, it is one who follows the companions in the sound understanding of Islam without straying from the pure teachings and one who does not inject into the religion newly invented matters the term Salafi applies to the one who identifies with the first three generations, follows their way, and calls to it. And the last vow, or the last syllable that we find in this term Salafi that you'll find in this newspaper article, in this magazine article, the last syllable in this word Salafi, in the Arabic language, actually goes back to what is called Ya'u Nisbah. And it is a letter of attribution, it's a letter of ascription. And all it means is that you ascribe yourself to a particular thing or place. So for example, if someone is from Pakistan, we say in the Arabic language they are Pakistani, right? And if someone is American and they're from America, then we say they are Amriki. And we put that, that ending at the end. So when one identifies themselves and ascribes themselves to the companions of the Prophet, in the pure following of the teachings of the Prophet, and they are the Salaf, then he is called Salafi. And that is exactly what it means and there should be no ambiguity with regard to that whatsoever. So that should be understood first and foremost before continuing on that that is the meaning of who is one who is Salafi. The next question says also we hear the word Wahhabi being mentioned in the same light. So what is a Wahhabi and how does it enter into this matter? Now we should understand that in this article the writer of this article, and I say in all humility that we call people to have integrity, journalistic integrity. And even in the field of academic writing, there are things that are known amongst them that must be implemented. From it is what we call ethos, pathos, and logos. What logos means is that you make a, a logical argument, a logical argument that is based and backed by proofs and evidences. And it is not enough amongst academic writers to make a claim without supporting your claim. If you do not support your claim, then you have not implemented the law of logos in academic writing. Secondly, there is what is called pathos, where one appeals to someone's emotions. They want to try to appeal to someone's emotions, fear being from them. And it seems that he has captured this very well. And the third one being ethos, which means that you establish credibility in your writing. And one of the ways that you establish credibility in your writing is to bring proofs and evidences. And if you do not bring proofs and evidences, logos, then you do not establish ethos. So I ask you if one just makes a broad claim, a blanket statement, and does not support it with names and places and dates and people, then has he established, has he established from the field of academic writing what we call ethos, credibility in his writing? At any rate, the article says that these Salafis and Wahhabis are the ones who are radicalizing these prisoners. So what is a Wahhabi? And what does this term mean? Again, we have been hearing in the media that the Wahhabi methodology is that which has been charging the climate of hate and the spark of the rage of global terrorism and the likes of this. So let us look at the history of this Wahhabism and the scholar of which it is attributed to. The name Wahhabi comes from the great scholar and noble scholar Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab who was from the Arabian Peninsula in the region known as Najd which is now today in the area of Riyadh in Saudi Arabia where the capital is at. He was born in the year 1110 after the migration of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and Muhammad Abdul Wahhab was born into a scholarly house. 
His father was from the people of knowledge of his region who also worked as a judge in the Islamic court, courts. His grandfather also, Suleiman, was a great scholar of Islamic jurisprudence and was the one who, called, who was called upon to pass religious, religious verdicts. So Muhammad Abdul Wahhab was raised in this learned environment and he memorized the entire Quran by the age of 10. He was known to have a sharp mind and an incredibly fast memory. He studied the books of the Hanbali school of thought at the hands of his father and he studied the books of jurisprudence also and he did extensive, extensive research into the books of Ibn Taymiyyah and also his student Ibn Qayyim al jawziyah It was these two scholars, Ibn Taymiyyah and also Ibn Qayyim that had the greatest effect on Muhammad Abdul Wahhab in adapting to the correct understanding of Islam and firmly planting his heart in the sound creed of the religion of Al-Islam. So after mentioning this, we mention that Shaykh Muhammad Abdul Wahhab, he came up in a time in the Arabian Peninsula where the association of gods besides Allah, idols were in the different uh, places of worship and the likes of this. So he called to the pure teachings of Islam to remove these idols and to return to the worship of one God alone, ascribing no partners with him. And he called to leaving off the affairs of sin and transgression from the murder. Many do not know that this sheikh, this scholar, Muhammad Abdul Wahhab, he has a tremendous book called Al-Kaba'ir, the book of the major sins. And from those major sins that he warns against is murder and theft and the likes of these matters. So for one who actually follows the methodology of Muhammad al-Wahhab, he is one who fights against crime and murder and theft and the likes of these things. And there are many other benefits and fruits that came from the illustrious call of Sheikh Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab. However, from the most important of these is the correcting of the Islamic creed and clearing it from what has crept into it from the affairs of polytheism and hated innovations and the spread of the call of Salafiyah, the call of the companions of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, across the different lands. And in truth, the word Wahhabi is not a legitimate title. In truth, the term and the label Wahhabi is not a legitimate title. Not for Muhammad Abdul Wahhab himself and not for those who came after him following in his footsteps. Since Muhammad Abdul Wahhab did not come with a new call, nor did he come with an innovative movement, rather he merely revived the call of those who came before him. He revived and implemented the call of Ibn Taymiyyah as we've already mentioned. He revised the call of Imam Malik, the great scholar of, uh, of Islam, Malik, and also Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal, and the call of the successors of the companions before them, and reviving the call of the companions themselves who followed the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. So Muhammad Abdul Wahhab did not come with a new movement. And therefore to title those who came after him with being Wahhabis is incorrect, as they are not following Muhammad Abdul Wahhab himself, but rather the methodology that he followed from those who preceded him and those who preceded him all the way back to the Prophet Muhammad peace and blessings be upon him. So if Ibn Taymiyyah, and this is our argument, if Ibn Taymiyyah came before Muhammad Abdul Wahhab and was upon the exact methodology, is it correct to call Ibn Taymiyyah a Wahhabi? But he came before Muhammad Abdul Wahhab. So how could you in justice and in truth call a man who preceded a man by a man who came after him. So could you call Ibn Taymiyyah who lived before Muhammad Abdul Wahhab, could you call him a Wahhabi? Would it not be more correct to call the followers of Ibn Taymiyyah and those who came after him, including Muhammad Abdul Wahhab, Taymiyyin? Would it not be more correct to label Muhammad Abdul Wahhab with being Taymi, meaning a follower of Ibn Taymiyyah, as opposed to him being a Wahhabi? Yet, if Ibn Taymiyyah was upon the same methodology as Sufyan al who was a scholar who came before him, would it be more correct to call him Wahhabi? Or to call him Taymi? 
Or would it be more correct to call both of them Thawri, meaning those who followed Sufyan and Thawri. But what about Sa'id ibn Musayyib, who was from the successors of the companions who came before them, all of them upon the same methodology? Would it be correct to call him the generation after the Prophet? Would it be correct to call him a Wahhabi? But he came before Muhammad al Wahhab, but they are both upon the same methodology? Or would it be more correct to call all of them Musayyibi? Or should we call all of them upon that which they call themselves being Salafi? Muhammad Abdul Wahhab and those who came before him. This is what is more correct and this is what is closest to the truth. Rather they were Salafi, identifying with the Salaf, working upon their way and calling towards it. Sheikh Muhammad Abdul Wahhab himself, now we're going to quote from him, we're going to establish our ethos. We're going to establish our credibility. We're not just going to make a claim, now we're going to quote from the source himself. Muhammad Abdul Wahhab said, and we are quoting, we are the adherers to the book, meaning the Quran, and the authentic traditions of the Prophet Muhammad and the Salaf, the companions of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, of this nation. And what they relied upon from the statements of the Imams, of the scholars of this religion. So therefore we have established in this statement, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that Muhammad Abdul Wahhab was a Salafi, and he was not a Wahhabi, and we are not Wahhabis, and this title is not correct, nor should it be attributed to those who have followed in the example of Muhammad Abdul Wahhab, and following the example of those who came before him, and following the example of Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. So those who adhere to the Salafi methodology are no more Wahhabi than they are Taymi, or Shafi'i, or Bekiri, or anything other than this. May Allah reward you with good understanding. And now after mentioning this, there was also a statement made recently, on to the next question. There was a statement made recently in one of the local papers that claims that there is a type of Islam that has from its tenets the committing of crime and murder. So what is the correct stance of the religion of Islam regarding these matters? First of all, before entering into that, I want to say that it should be mentioned what the scholar and the head of the Islamic affairs in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, Sheikh Saleh Ali Sheikh, said in regard to the establishment of the religion of Al-Islam and the establishment of the two testimonies, the testimony that nothing has a right to be worshipped except for Allah and the testimony that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. That what those matters return back to are three things. There are three things that those matters return back to in the true implementation of the religion, in truth. He said, firstly, it goes back to abandoning polytheism and associating partners in worship with the one God in all of its forms and types. Secondly, abandoning innovations and newly invented matters in the religion in all of its types. And thirdly, in abandoning sin and transgression in all of its types. This last matter of sin and transgression, what is included in this are the crimes of what we are now discussing. First of them being murder. What does Islam say about the taking of human life? In the Quran, again we're going back to the Quran. We have been commanded in Islam to refer all of our affairs back to the Quran and back to the authentic traditions of our Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and the understanding of the companions. The first affair is what Allah says about murder. He says, say, O Muhammad. He's now commanding the prophet to inform the people. Come, I will recite what your Lord has prohibited from you. Join nothing in worship with Allah. Be good and dutiful to your parents. And do not kill your children for fear of poverty. We provide sustenance for you and for them. Come not near to shameful sins like fornication and adultery, whether committed openly or secretly. And do not take the life of anyone who Allah has forbidden. This he has commanded you, that you may understand. So clearly if someone was to ask you, what is Islam's position with regard to this? It is not fair to ask the question, are there a group of individuals who are going about and claiming that Islam calls to the likes of these matters? What is a more fair and just question is, what does Islam say about these things? 
And what does Islam say about these people who do these things? That is the just question and the more correct question. And where, as we have just heard from the Quran, where from the things that we have been prohibited are to murder people and take the life of, un -people, uh, of people unjustly. Also Allah says in another verse in the, in the noble Quran, because of that we ordain for the children of Israel, of Israel, of Israel, that if anyone killed a person, not because of a life for a life, or because they were spreading corruption in the earth, it would be as if they killed all of mankind. And if anyone saved a life, it would be as if they saved the life of all mankind. Islam teaches us that the act of murder is so evil and so heinous, it is as if you have killed a number of people. You have taken the life of a whole group of people. And that when you save a life, it is as if you have saved the life of all of mankind. This is how precious human life is to the religion of Al-Islam. So let it be known and let it be said that this is what Islam teaches with regard to the sanctity of human life. And also Allah says in the Quran, and do not kill anyone which Allah has forbidden except for a just cause. And the example of a just cause is a life for a life. Someone murders something, so someone, then their life is taken for, as we call the death penalty. And whoever is killed intentionally with hostility and oppression and not by mistake, we have given his heir the authority to demand the law of equality. A life for a life, as we have mentioned. Or to forgive or to take the blood with money, the payment of compensation. But let him not exceed the limits in the matter of taking life. Verily he is helped by the Islamic legislation. So this verse shows us again that Allah has forbade murder. He has forbidden murder and has called it oppression and hostility in this particular verse. And also we find another verse in the Quran where Allah talks about the true worshippers. Allah talks about his true worshippers and he says, And those who do not call upon any God besides Allah, nor do they take a life Allah has forbidden except for just cause. And as we've mentioned from that, a life for a life. Nor commit illegal sexual intercourse. And whoever does these acts shall receive the punishment. So in this particular verse, Allah has mentioned that whoever commits these acts of major sin, they will be punished not only in this life, but they will be punished by their creator in the next life. So let no one fool you into believing that Islam condones these actions. Let no one fool you into believing that Islam accepts the likes of these actions. Rather, they are condemned and they are from the greatest of sins in our religion. In an authentic narration that comes from the companion of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, where the Prophet Muhammad said, there is no soul that murders someone unjustly except that there is upon the first son of Adam, Cain, a portion of the blood because he was the first to commit murder. So again, we see that this crime of murder is something that is inherited. And the person who does so, the one that he learned it from with the likes of this, receives something of the punishment, something of the blame for falling into the likes of that sin. Also, so for those who believe or they argue that the blood of the non-Muslim is permissible because they have no rights, for those who make this claim and they make this statement, let it be understood from the authentic narration of our Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, upon the authority of his companion Abu Huraira where he said, whoever killed a mu'ahid, the non-Muslim, of which there is an agreement of tranquility and peace between them, whoever kills this non-Muslim will not smell the fragrance of paradise. And indeed its fragrance can be smelled for a distance of 40 years. So this crime of murdering the non-Muslim in this fashion unjustly is from those things that the Prophet has mentioned will inhibit or prohibit an individual from smelling the beautiful fragrance of paradise. So after hearing these narrations, can anyone claim that Islam condones the likes of these matters? Rather, they must be just and honorable and say that Islam is from the harshest and hardest against the likes of these crimes and transgressions against mankind. The great scholar of Islam, 
whose name was Muhammad ibn Ahmed al-Zahabi. He wrote a monumental work known as Al-Kaba'ir, The Major Sins. And he counted murder second only to associating partners in worship with Allah. This is in keeping with the ordering that we find in those verses that we mentioned where Allah says, and those who do not call upon any God besides Allah nor take the life that Allah has forbidden. So after associating partners in worship, polytheism, the worst sin mentioned that can be committed is the crime of murder. After mentioning what Islam says about murder, we move on to the second affair of the crime of armed robbery. Those who go about in the earth with their illegal weapons causing fear and anxiety amongst the citizens of our nation and amongst our towns and our cities and our countries. Allah says about them in the holy book, the noble book, the Quran. Indeed the recompense, indeed the reward of those who wage war against Allah and his messenger. Now I want us to understand quickly what, what I'm saying here. Allah has said that those people who brandish their weapons and shake the society and bring fear to society and enter into banks and rob people and hijack people upon the highways and carjack and all of these things, Allah has described them as being at war with Allah and His Messenger. Does Islam condone it? Allah said they're at war with Allah and His Messenger. So how can anyone claim that Islam condones the likes of these matters? And Allah goes on in the ayat, in the meaning of the ayat and says, and those who spread corruption in the earth, their recompense, their reward is to be put to death. Their reward and their recompense is to be put to death to the end of that verse. And after this verse, Imam al-Dhahabi, that great scholar as we had mentioned, he says concerning the meaning of this verse, he said, so the mere act of causing fear in society is a major sin. The mere act of causing fear to people in society is a major sin in Islam. So how much more if they rob people? Adding on top of causing fear, now they're robbing people. And how much more if they kill someone? Or how much more if they do any number of sins? Any number of sins that we find these individuals committing. There's a story that further clarifies Islam's position. With those who go about in the earth with their, with their weapons. And they rob banks. And they hijack cars and they, and they carjack people and the likes of these affairs. There's a further narration, authentic tradition of our prophet that shows the, the firm stance that Islam has against these actions. In the authentic book of the scholar Imam al-Bukhari, the great scholar Bukhari, he brings the narration that there came a group of people to the prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, to pledge allegiance to him and to enter Islam. So they dwelt in the city of the Prophet for a time, but they became sick. I Meaning they were from a different region and when they came and began to eat of the foods and the likes of this, they became sick. They had some stomach ailments. So the Prophet advised them to go out to the desert area and to drink from the milk of the camel. As the drinking of the milk of the camel was known to be a good cure, a good treatment for this type of stomach ailment. So they went out to this desert area amongst some of the uh, shepherds and once they began to drink from the milk of the camels and the likes of this, when they were cured from their sicknesses, their sickness, what they did was they took up their weapons and they killed the shepherd. They murdered him. And then they stole his flock. They stole his flock of animals, his sheep. So what happened when the word got back to the Prophet Muhammad wasallam that these individuals had done this? The Prophet who was the, the leader of the, of the society at that time, he sent out a search party to capture these individuals and once they were captured and brought back, the prophet ordered that they be put to death. The prophet ordered that these individuals be put to death. They were given the death penalty. So there is no question whatsoever. What is the reward in the religion of Islam and the recompense for those who go about causing murder in the earth and those who go about with their weapons, robbing people and harming people, they have been described as being, as being at war with Allah and at war with his messenger and their reward is to be put to death. Now some people may consider this a very harsh, uh, a very harsh punishment. But it should be understood that the punishment should fit the crime. It should be understood that the punishment should fit the crime. 
And this is a means of being a deterrence so that when other people see that if you go about in the earth harming people and robbing people and murdering people and the likes of these matters, that if you do these kinds of acts, then you forfeit your own life. And if people were to see this type of punishment being dished out, then they would be quite careful as opposed to going about in the earth and causing this type of corruption and chaos. So that is the ruling of Al-Islam with regards to that matter. The third matter that we want to discuss from this issue is the matter of drugs and drug dealing. As in many of these cases that we have found, there have been drugs that have been found on the person of these criminals. There have been drugs found upon their person. So what does Islam say with regards to this affair of drugs and intoxicants? Islam has prohibited intoxicants in the Quran and the authentic traditions of the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, because of its harm to the body, the mind, and society as a whole. And drugs are indeed a form of intoxicant. And it is incumbent upon every Muslim to refrain from drug abuse and drug trafficking. The noble scholar or the noble companion of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, his name was Ibn Abbas. He mentions that the prohibition of intoxicants came for a very specific reason. He says it was revealed because of two tribes from amongst the Arabs. And what happened were these two, dro- these two tribes drank so much wine, so much intoxicants, that they became so drunk that they, became to, they began to fight with one another. So when the morning came, they didn't even remember what had happened the night before. And they had marks upon their faces and their beards were torn out, the hair was torn out from their faces and the likes of this. And when one of them saw what had happened to them, to their face, they would say, my brother did this to me? There was no brotherhood in his heart. If my brother did this to me, he didn't really feel that I was his brother. This is what they were saying. This is how they felt. If he was truly merciful, he would have never done this to me. So the point that the scholars have mentioned with regard to this narration is first, when one drinks these intoxicants, it takes you out of your mind. And you don't know what you're doing. And what is the result of that are all kinds of sin and transgression against Allah. What was the quote that was mentioned in the newspaper? He said, I was so high... I didn't even realize that I had killed the police officer. Huh? This is what is reported that he has said. But how many instances do we know of where people are taking these different drugs that are in the streets, wet, and these other things that they're calling them, and bombing fluid, and all of these affairs that, you, that people use to bury their dead. And they're smoking these matters, and they're losing their minds, and the next day they have no idea what took place the night before. This is why intoxicants were forbidden in the religion of Al-Islam. Look at the justice of of Islam. Islam saw that this was causing fighting and corruption amongst the the brotherhood, the companions themselves. So therefore Allah, the creator of mankind, forbade the usage of intoxicants for that very reason. So therefore no one should understand that if an individual is caught with 19 grams of crack or whatever in their pocket, This in no way has anything to do with Islam. Islam forbade it over 1400 years ago. Before it was forbade in this nation or any other nation that we know of in the modern era, it was forbade over 1400 years ago in the Arabian Peninsula during the time of the Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. The noble scholar, Sheikh bin Baz, who was the uh, the mufti of the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, the one who gave religious verdicts, in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, he was asked with regards to this affair. And it's very interesting that these, this, this author, this writer of this article, that he specifically tried to link Saudi Arabia to much of what is going on. It is quite amazing that much of what we have read so far today and what we are going to read against all of these things that have been made publicly and are written in books and recorded have come from the scholars of the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. It's quite ironic that this individual claims that it is the the scholars of Saudi Arabia that are the cause of the problem when we are quoting statement after statement from these same scholars from the kingdom of Saudi Arabia that are opposing and fighting against this evil and transgression in society. At any rate, the noble scholar Sheikh bin Baz who used to give the religious verdicts in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, he was asked about someone who dies and he is fighting, and he dies fighting against the spread of drugs. An officer 
Now, this question was asked about in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia specifically about an officer who dies fighting against the, dr the spread of drugs, drug, drug trafficking. What happens to that person? So the question is says, there is no doubt that the Office of Drug Enforcement struggles to stop the means by which the poison of drugs enters this pure country, meaning Saudi Arabia, despite continued attempts by drug dealers, by the help of Allah and the efforts of the drug prevention officers. The attempts of the drug traffickers fail at every turn. My question to you, O oh honored Sheikh, my question to you, O oh honored Sheikh, if an officer is killed in a raid on a group of drug dealers, does he die a martyr? And what about those who help those officers to find the hideous, uh, the hideouts, excuse me, the hideouts of drug dealers? What is their reward? So the Sheikh, he responds. He says, without a doubt, beyond a shadow of doubt, fighting intoxicants and drug trafficking is one of the greatest forms of striving in the path of Allah. I mean, what more can be said? I'll continue with the Sheikh's statement, but we could stop here. It is from the greatest forms of striving in the way of Allah. Individuals in the society helping in its prevention is one of the most important obligations because it is a benefit of the society. It is a benefit for the society. And because it, meaning drugs, its spread and proliferation is detrimental. And if his intention was good, meaning this one, this officer who fought against drugs and tried to stop drugs and he is killed, if his intention was good, he dies a martyr. And whosoever helps to stop these drug traffickers, whoever helps to stop these drug traffickers and informs the authorities about them, then he will be rewarded as one who struggles in the way of truth. And in the cause of benefit for the Muslims, and protecting their society from harm. This is what Islam teaches us. This is what the scholars of Arabia teach us. This is what Sheikh bin Baz, who was a Salafi, this is what he taught us. That to turn in drug dealers and to inform the authorities about them is from the ways of striving in the path of Allah and you will receive reward from your Lord for doing so. And then the Sheikh, he ends the statement by saying, so we ask Allah to guide those drug dealers and to protect them from the evil of their own selves as well as the plots from Satan. We also ask Allah to help the agencies that fight the spread of drugs and to make them victorious over the party of Satan. Now the Sheikh is calling the drug dealers the party of Satan and he is the best to ask. Allah is the best to ask for his help. I don't think there's anything clearer when anyone wants to ask us with regards to Islam's position, with regards to drug dealing and drug trafficking, this is what you say to them is the position of Islam. The next issue that comes up in this matter is the issue of people wearing a Muslim woman's garb and clothing in the commission of crimes. As this took place, as we mentioned, from those individuals who robbed the bank and murdered one of the police officers in Philadelphia, that they were wearing the Islamic garb. So what is the Islamic ruling with regards to this? And does Islam condone and allow the likes of these actions? We firstly want to mention again, we want to establish our credibility and we want to mention upon the authority of Abu Huraira, who was a companion of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, that the Prophet cursed the man who wears the dress of women and women who wear the dress of men. So what Islam says about this action of theirs is that they were cursed in the beginning. When they first put on those clothes, they were cursed by our Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Before the commission of the crime, before going into the bank, before carrying their weapons, at the time of placing that woman's garb upon their backs, they were cursed by our Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, or at the very least, they fall under the threat of this particular narration of our Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. In another authentic narration where it mentions upon the authority of Abdullah ibn Amr who again was the companion of the Prophet Muhammad peace and blessings be upon him where he said I heard the messenger of Allah say he is not from us the man who imitates the women and the women who imitate the men. So even in their trying to walk like women 
so as to disguise themselves. Prophet Muhammad وسلم, peace and blessings be upon him, has freed himself from these individuals. He has freed himself from these individuals and their act. The purpose, now we mentioned, the purpose of the, of the woman's dress is explained in the Quran. Why do our sisters dress like this? Maybe the non-Muslims, they don't understand the reason for this. So we'll explain something of the history from a verse in the Quran to explain it and then explain further why this was such a heinous and evil act. The purpose of the women's dress is explained in the Quran where Allah says, O Prophet, say to your wives and your daughters and the women of the believers to cover themselves with their overgarments that they will be known and not be harmed. That they will be known as believing women and they will not be harmed. So the purpose of the covering of the Muslim sisters, the Muslim women that you see, is that you will know that they're Muslim women and that they will not be harmed. Because what happened during the time of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, that sometimes the women, if they traveled by night, if they walked outside of their homes by night, there would be, there would be men, criminal men, who would try to rape them and try to harm them. So if they were to see these women adorning themselves like this, then they would know that these were Muslim women who were striving to be righteous and noble and honorable, and they would leave them alone. So the purpose of the, the covering is so that the woman is known and therefore left out of harm's way. So what makes this action of those even, even more evil is they have contradicted the very meaning of this verse. They have contradicted the very nature or the reason of why this verse was revealed in the first place. Because what they have done by their action is brought about harm to the Muslim women. They have brought about harm and put the sisters in harm's way by this action of theirs. So this act of men wearing the dress of Muslim women, whether in the commission of a crime or otherwise, is a great sin in Islam and is totally rejected by our upright way, rather was an action that was cursed by the prophet of Islam. Peace and blessings be upon him. The next question is what does Islam say regarding cooperating with the authorities in stopping crime in society? And I think this is a very important question. And this may be an issue that some people may have no understanding with regard to this. So we want to clarify very, very, very surely, by the permission of our Lord, of how important this matter is. And we're going to quote now from one of our scholars, Sheikh Ahmed and Najmi, who again is from the scholars of the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And we learn from him with regard to this matter, and he's Salafi, and we learn from him with regard to this matter about cooperating with non-Muslim authorities, whether they be informing against Muslims or other than Muslims. He says, it is permissible if the non-Muslims seek from us to cooperate with them in the prevention of those things that Islam prohibits and fights against. From the prohibition of corruption, including things like drug dealing and drug smuggling, and to cooperate in combating it in all of its forms and types, and also the prevention of crime, and stamping it out and punishing the perpetrators of these crimes. And from these crimes, the crime of terrorism. And this includes assassinations and bombings and revolutions and kidnappings. And other than this, things of which when they occur, the result is great fear and panic among the people of which they cannot establish a stable society. And there is no safety and security. He continues. And Islam calls to safety and security and praises it. So Islam commands with stability and the spread of peace and tranquility. And it prohibits terrorizing citizens and spreading panic and fear among them. This is Ahmed Najmi, who was Salafi and from the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. After one of these affairs that had taken place, one of the officers who was killed in the city of Philadelphia, after it took place, the Salafi community reached out to our scholars for some advice. And we wanted to be known that there's an old saying that absence of knowledge of a thing 
does not necessitate its absence. Just because you do not know that a thing takes place does not mean it did not take place. So when these articles say, why haven't the Muslims condemned these actions? Why haven't the Muslims spoke out against these actions? We say we have. And the recording that I'm about to quote from was stated by the scholar Sheikh Ubaid al-Jabri from the kingdom of Saudi Arabia also no more than a week after Offer Lisbinski was killed. Is it Lisbinski? No. After he was killed. No more than a week after he was killed. And this particular recording was disseminated amongst the people of our city. So because the author of this article did not know that this this took place, does not mean it did not take place. And is it not from journalistic integrity to ask the people who ascribe to being Salafi, what is their statement with regard to this before saying that they have not condemned it? At any rate, we quote from the Sheikh Ubaid al-Jabiri, who was a former teacher of the Islamic University in Medina in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. He was called to, to, for some advice after the officer was killed. And we began to see some of the problems that were going on in our city. So he was called for some advice for the Muslims. Now listen to what the, the scholar, the, the great scholar says. My advice to the Muslims in America and Europe. I advise them to display all of the good and beautiful qualities of this religion. Because these qualities are praiseworthy and lofty. They spread safety and security in the land and establish justice among all people. Whether they practice Islam or whether they practice other than Islam from the Christians and Jews. And I say to you, indeed your neighbors from the non-Muslims are observing you. And they are observing your actions and your statements. So if they see from you, O Muslims, that you keep your word and you refrain from harming people, and you honor your contracts, and you are truthful people, and you safeguard people's lives, property, and honor, and stay away from oppression, then they, the non-Muslims, will feel at ease with you, and they will be comfortable around you. And this is from the means of inviting to the way of Allah. And how many from the non-Muslims accepted Islam? Based on what they witnessed of noble character and good manners from the Muslims. The Sheikh, he continues, so spread the noble qualities of your religion. And if certain things take place from some individuals among the Muslims of crime and transgression upon your neighbors from the non-Muslims, from acts of murder and armed robbery or other than that, then announce to all of the people that you are free from them and their actions. Announce to all of the people that you are free from these criminals and their actions. For indeed, these individuals, even if they ascribe to Islam, indeed Islam is free from their actions. And those Muslims who practice Islam correctly are also free from them and what they do of savage and evil behavior. Can we be any more clear? Can we be any more clear on the position of the Salafis with regards to these affairs? The great scholar Sheikh Urbaid al-Jabri called them savage and evil behavior. The questioner then after this says to the Sheikh, the questioner, in this recording he says, as you know of what happened in Philadelphia, of three individuals from the Muslims dressing in women's garb and robbing a bank. So because of this despicable act, one of the assailants and an officer was killed. And many problems resulted from this. So what are your thoughts on this incident? And what is your advice to the Muslims in Philadelphia? Again, this is again from the great scholar, Urbaid al-Jabri, who is Salafi from the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. The Sheikh, he says, the answer. I have said previously that if acts of transgression occur from individuals who ascribe to Islam, it is upon you to free yourselves from these individuals and their actions. For indeed, Islam and those who practice the pure teachings of Islam are free from these corrupt actions. Those who truly follow the way of the Prophet Muhammad honor the contracts between them and their neighbors from the non-Muslims. Second, they refrain from bringing harm to people and they do not transgress against people's lives, property, or honor. 
Third, they deal with all people with truthfulness in word and deed, and they keep their trust and they establish justice in the earth. And then after this, the Sheikh, he began to address those Muslims who committed these acts that we have mentioned from murder and armed robbery. Listen to what the Sheikh, he says. Firstly, these individuals have harmed the Muslims by their evil actions, which are considered transgression against people's lives and property. And the people of Islam are free from this. Secondly, from the evil acts that they have done is dressing in the garb of women. So what results from this act is that it puts Muslim women in harm's way. So every time a woman goes out and she is covered in the manner that Allah has prescribed for her in the noble Quran, she may be searched by the authorities and she may even be patted down in her private areas. And the result of this came by what? By way of the evil and despicable acts that were perpetrated by these criminals. And these acts are considered being treacherous to one's agreement. They are considered being treacherous to one's agreement. And that agreement is that whether you live in America or Europe or in a non-Muslim country, that there is an agreement that you do not bring harm to people, not to shed their blood, nor to take their property. So those who did these crimes were treacherous to this agreement. So the noble scholar, we say in conclusion that the noble scholar, Sheikh Ubaid al-Jabri, called these acts despicable and said they are treacherous to the agreement between the Muslims and the societies that they live in. And the noble scholar said in conclusion, I supplicate to Allah to unite the word of the Muslims in America and Europe upon what is pleasing to Allah from the pure worship of Allah and following the way and example of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and to grant them stabi stability upon the truth, and rejecting falsehood, and keeping one's oath, and being truthful in speech, and to establish justice, and spread safety and security among themselves and their neighbors from the non-Muslims. Again, I want to continue with the next statement from the king of the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, Abdullah ibn Abdul Aziz. And I mention this statement because I want to show what the rulers of Islam and the ruler of Saudi Arabia said after the events that have taken place of 9-11 other than that from terrorism and extremism. We want to see what the king said with regard to these matters and his advice to his nation, his, his advice to Saudi Arabia. The king, he said, my brothers... And he was actually advising the scholars as well. My brothers, you know that we are in the midst of difficult days. Therefore, you must act with moderation and examine every word you say. As you are responsible to Allah and to the Islamic nation, I wish you success and that Allah will inspire you. We are now in a situation that demands that we act with wisdom and awareness. As you in this country, meaning Saudi Arabia, are an example for your Muslim brethren, first and foremost, I counsel you to fear Allah, serve your religion and your homeland, and seek words of logic in order to serve Islam. I counsel you not to allow emotion to take you over and allow no one to provoke you because each of you is responsible before your Lord and before your people and your homeland and your family and your children and your honor. We are today in the midst of a time that obligates us to examine with restraint every word that leaves our mouths. I hope that you will bear this responsibility before Allah, before your people and before the authorities so that we are not pushed into a corner as these religious matters must be considered in peace and tranquility. And because Allah has said in the Quran, we have made you a middle course nation. We have made you a moderate nation. So the king of the kingdom of Saudi Arabia is reminding the Muslims, the scholars amongst them, that we are a nation that is moderate. We are not extreme. We should not be allowing our emotions to get the best of us in all of these matters. And we are also to weigh every word that we say before we speak 
For indeed we are responsible before our Lord. And I will conclude in the last statement which is found from the noble scholar Muhammad ibn Salih al-Uthaymeen. Again, from the scholars of the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Again, one who ascribes to being Salafi. So let us see what he says and what he has taught us with regards to these particular matters. And that which I am quoting, this translation was actually done nine years ago, eight years ago, or more than that. But at any rate, well before any of these events have taken place. So what does he say? He says, likewise, I advise you to have respect for those people who have the right to be respected from those between you, meaning the Muslims, and whom there is an agreement of protection, meaning the non-Muslims. Since the land in which you are living, meaning America and Europe and the likes of this, the land in which you are living contains such an agreement of peace between you, between you and them. If this were not the case, then they would have expelled you from their country. They haven't kicked any of us out that I know of, huh? So therefore, there's an agreement of peace and tranquility between us. So the shaykh, he continues, so preserve this agreement and do not prove treacherous to it since treachery is a sign of the hypocrites and it is not from the way of the believers and know that what is authentically reported from the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, that he said, whoever kills one who is under an agreement of protection will not smell the fragrance of paradise. Do not be fooled by those sayings of the foolish people, those who say that these people are non-Muslims, so their wealth is lawful for us, meaning we can take their wealth, we can kill them, and the likes of these particular matters. So do not be fooled by the sayings of the foolish people. Those who say that these people are non-Muslim, so their wealth is lawful for us, meaning that we can steal it and murder them in all of these affairs. For we swear by Allah, this is a lie. It is a lie about the religion of Allah and a lie upon the Islamic societies. O my brothers, O youth, O Muslims, be truthful in your buying and selling and renting and leasing and in your mutual transactions because truthfulness is from the characteristics of the believers and Allah the Most High has commanded with truthfulness in his saying, O you who believe, fear Allah and keep your duty to Allah and be with those who are truthful. And the Prophet Muhammad encouraged truthfulness and said, adhere to being truthful because truthfulness leads to goodness and goodness leads to paradise. And a person will continue to be truthful and strive to be truthful until he will be recorded and written down with Allah as a truthful person. And that's the end of the narration of the prophet. And the shaykh, he continues, and he warned against falsehood, and he said, beware of falsehood, because falsehood leads to wickedness, and wickedness leads to the fire, and a person will continue to lie and strive to lie until he will be written down and recorded with Allah as a great liar. And that's the end of the narration of the prophet. And the Shaykh Ruthaymin, again from Saudi Arabia, he concludes by saying, O oh my Muslim brothers, O oh youth, be true in your sayings with your brothers and with those non-Muslims whom you live among them, so that you will be inviters to the religion of Islam by your actions and in reality. So how many people are those who first entered Islam because of the good behavior and manners of the Muslims and their truthfulness and their dealings? So we conclude with that particular advice, those advices from our scholars. And we mentioned that those are the evidences and the proofs that have come in the regard to those questions that were asked. And we hope to our Lord, the creator of the heavens and the earth, that we are able to disseminate this information to the masses and that people have justice and they, are, and they strive to be correct or just with regards to how they treat these evidences and proofs when they hear them and that they understand that they cannot condemn an entire people, an entire community by the actions of some individuals amongst them, especially when that community condemns those actions even harder and harsher than they may.
So with all of that, we thank you for your time and we hope to our Lord that this was some benefit. And if there are any other questions that may be, uh, that may arise uh, from amongst the community and amongst the citizens, then we encourage them to reach out for, uh, to us and to ask us their questions and we will respond to their questions appropriately by uh, giving them the information and the verdicts from the scholars of the religion of Islam. And I also want to say before we close out that this is what we need to be doing is reminding people that they want to ask people of knowledge because one of the problems that we find in these articles as well is that they will interview everyone who comes and goes as we say in our language every time Dick and Harry. So you'll find them going to example, for example they'll go to someone who is a butcher. He owns a butcher shop. He's Muslim but he, owns, he just owns a butcher shop. And they'll ask him his opinion with regard to these matters. And he may not be knowledgeable in the religion. And therefore he may make a statement that is not correct according to what Islam teaches. Out of ignorance. And what I always try to mention is that if one of you from most the media other than that, if you wanted to do an article on brain surgery, you would go to a brain surgeon and you wouldn't go to someone who worked in the cafeteria at the hospital. So this is something that you should strive to do. Go to the people of knowledge. And in our religion, our Lord commands us, ask the people of knowledge when you don't know. And the scholars that we have quoted from today are men of, of learning and knowledge, men in their 60s and their 70s who were teachers in, in universities who have doctorate, PhD degrees, and other than that. And they are great teachers of our religion. These are the ones that we are striving to remind you to ask your questions to. And you can ask us and we refer those questions to them as we did for the Sheikh Rabbi al Javi that we read the recording to you. So with that, we want to conclude and we thank you for your time.